Well, it's good to be here again. Uh, the picture on the screen is from the uh, beautiful, beautiful Redwoods uh, Highway 1. Uh, this is just, um, oh my goodness, about 30 minutes north of Fort Bragg. You, there's just a pull out and you can walk out and here's this beautiful stream. Sunlight's kind of beaming through and the blue sky in the foreground is actually reflecting on the water itself. Anyway, I just love the things that Sherry has captured in her camera to give us a glimpse into God's creation. It's a beautiful place. So, uh, moving on now. Uh, again, as we go through the book of Revelation, uh, this is a conversation that is centered on how God sees things and how God thinks about his son, about how he thinks and has John write about it. And in this story, you will see as we unfold that God is always on the side of humanity. That is in this presentation as well. So we're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 4. Here's what I want you to think about. That as we went through those first three chapters, God calls John to attention in this vision. And then he shows John Jesus walking amongst the candlesticks, which then we unfold in chapters 2 and 3 to discover that Christ is nurturing and caring and leading his church through. And what we learned in those seven churches is that there were individuals who took the churches in directions they should not have gone. And there's an old saying, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I will tell you that even today, there are men and women who try to redirect the church after their own vision and their own image of what they think it should be. But in the book of Revelation, we're taken back to see that Jesus Christ is the head of his church. He is the head of his church. We're going to read all of chapter 4 today. It is not going to take us long, but you are going to enter into the very control center, the throne room of the entire universe. You are going to see images and characters and individuals that do not fit what you consider normal human perception. So your mind is going to be stretched and pushed, but keep in mind, you are entering into God's realm and John is faithfully writing it down for you. So, here we go. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this slide I said uh, the three chapters reveals earthly ministry. I was talking, not moving through the slide, so I'm going to skip that and go right on to the next slide. It says, Welcome to the Control Room of the Universe. And I'm just going to read through this carefully with you. This is chapter 4, and then each one of the slides will have the verses that are relevant. So here's verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard or had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. So now, coming back to uh, earth here for just a moment, John has seen the unfolding history of the seven churches, moving us through time right up to the Laodicean church in anticipation of the returning of the Lord. So after these things means after the things that John has seen in the seven churches. So it says in verses 2 and 3, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and the one sitting on the throne, and he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was, on the next slide, a rainbow around about the throne like an emerald in appearance. Now, I, I just love what this artist has captured as they put the rainbow in, and then you can see the emerald tones of the rainbow going out. And, and by the way, they're very, the artist here is very faithful to what the words are saying to us, all right? In verse 4, it says, Around the throne there were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 
24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their head. Now, I'm just going to come back and, and remind you two things about this white garment. One, the white garment is a gift of the righteousness of Christ that is given as a gift in the Laodicean church. Also, the white garment is what Jesus is wearing as he's ministering to his church. And in the Old Testament, it was the white garment, the robe that the priest wore as evidence of their ministry and the responsibility they carried. So please notice that these elders also are wearing not only the garment of the priest, but the garment that represents the righteousness of Christ himself. And I'll just let your imagination run with that. Let's go on to the next slide, verse 5. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, in this painting, what the artist has done is very interesting. Right in the foreground, at the bottom of that painting, is you can see they put a face to the seven spirits of God, and they put burning lamps right above the head of each one of those. Again, I'm just admiring the work of this particular artist because the challenge is sometimes to take these words and put them into a picture is very challenging. Notice that there are flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. I want you to know this is not some sleepy place. Now, growing up as a kid on our ranch with the uh, sheep and the cows and the dogs and the 12 white ducks we had, uh, one of the great joys of summer were the thunderstorms that came up out of the south. And I will never forget at times lightning striking the telephone pole coming down through the wire and lightning exploding in our farmhouse kitchen because we had metal cabinets and the hot water tanks set in behind him. Blue sparks in the room. Pretty exciting. Understand that in the throne room of God, there is this powerful charge of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There are moments in the future story of thunder and those thunders will represent judgments. We do not have the evidence that there are judgments yet in this story, though some may have come to that conclusion. Right now, John is just simply caught up in the glory, the splendor, and the things that are happening in the throne room of God. Quite a spectacular place. Moving on to verse 6. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, moving right on, four living creatures. Now, you need to pay careful attention here. Four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. Now, you could say they had incredible sight. There are some who would say that that word for eyes could also be jewels, that they were totally covered in spectacular jewels. Uh, I'm not going to solve that dilemma for you. I just want to leave it between you and God as you are hearing these words speak of these creatures full of these things that appear to be eyes, according to the translators. And the majority of all translators use the word I. So I'm just going to rest with that. Now notice carefully, though, verse 7. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had the face like that of a man. Verse 7, in the next slide, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes round, around, and within. So, if I were going to do a painting of this, I probably would be more likely to put, you know, semi-transparent glossomer wings on these creatures, first of all, instead of bird wings, because we sort of have this classic image of the wings of a bird. But there are so many creatures in creation that have glossomer wings. 
because when John is seeing this, he can see the eyes all around and through these, these things that are on the surface of this creature. So what do you do with a flying calf? What do you do with a eagle with six wings? What do you do with a lion with six wings? Now, in a moment, you're going to discover that these creatures, not only in the presence of throne, have animal-like features described in them, but they also have a voice, a remarkable voice, a voice of worship and praise. Just pause and let that settle in for just a moment. There is nothing ordinary in the presence of God. Are you with me on that? There is nothing ordinary in the presence of God. Continuing on. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. Was means he who was was in the past. He who is is the one who is in the present. And he who is to come is he who is in the future. Very interesting language. Almost a way to describe the omnipresence of God in time. And it's worthy to study time because God's sense of time is nothing like us as human beings. We're now going to verse 9. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, our last verse, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. I want to come back to this concept, especially in this last verse, because as worship this magnificent worship, these creatures who are praising holy, holy, holy and, and honor and glory and they're just worshiping and the elders who are getting up from their throne and casting their crowns down and kneeling before God and acknowledging his presence. At the heart of everything they are doing, it's because they owe their very existence to God himself. I wonder if we would reverence each other more if we understood what was happening in the throne room of God. If we celebrated God as creator, would we value his creation at a greater level? Would we care more about the earth and the things on the earth that as the creator God has made them, would we not want to treat them with greater respect? So what I'm challenging you is you go with John into the throne room of the universe, I want to challenge you with this issue. I want to challenge you with the reality is that everywhere you look around you, you are looking at the things of the creator that exist by his will. Do you value and respect that creation? And when you look at other people, do you see them from God's point of view? as his children, the ones he brought into existence, the ones whom he loves, the one who he redeems? Do you see the world from the throne room of God differently? Does it create a deeper passion in your life for your fellow man? I, I have a mantra, a saying that to me, is the very fundamental truth of what we consider to be Christian religion, but I challenge this irregardless of the religion you practice, and I ask it this way. 
Does your religion, the faith that you exercise, the faith that you live, does it make you kinder, more caring, more aware, and more thoughtful of the things and the people around you? Because I don't think you can go into the throne room of God where we have just gone by Scripture, by words from John. I just believe that if you have gone into that throne room and you do it in your worship every day, that you will leave there with a greater awe, a greater value, a greater respect for not only creation itself, but for the men, women, and children in the creation. Does your religion make you kinder? I say that if you go into the throne room of God, you come out totally different. Think about that. When you pray, you are taken by the Spirit into the very presence of God. Do you walk away from that prayer experience a different person? That is Revelation chapter 4. That is where it takes us. That is the challenge it leaves us. I pray that it will have a radical impact on your heart, on your life, on your family and your children or your parents or the people you will meet tomorrow. I pray that your experience in the throne room is like the elders that you want to fall before the creator of the universe and acknowledge the goodness and the kindness and the grace that he extends us every day. And this is just the beginning. We have chapter 5 coming up next. So our closing picture that I borrowed from Sherry is the Palouse River cut out of this spectacular canyon. If you were to turn and look 180 degrees to the left, you would see this spectacular Palouse Falls uh, coming off those cliffs down into that great pool where this river has washed out this spectacular canyon. And you can see the basalt, uh, basalt uh, crystals and pillars along the sides of the canyon. Uh, it's just one of those awe moments you get sometimes when you're in creation. And we're looking down. I mean, those are pretty tall cliffs there. Quite a spectacular view. I pray that you will enjoy them. Our next presentation is Revelation chapter 5. We get to spend some more time in the throne room of God.